Yep. So welcome to the first interactive session of the day, how open finance will take off. We've got a fantastic lineup of speakers and please, you want to make this as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions, comments for the panelists, please post them in the chat. Um, but for now, I think it'd be great for everyone to introduce themselves. I'm Lisa Moyle, Director of Strategy at VC Innovations. And let's start with you, Matt. Hi, Lisa. Um, Matt Kikane, Chief Commercial Officer here at Yapoli. And over to you, Simon. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me onto the panel. Uh, my name is Simon Curate, and I'm the CEO of Funding Options, uh, and we're Europe's leading marketplace for SME finance. And next up, Roisin, please. Hi, I'm Roisin Levine. I'm head of banks at FinTech called Flux. Uh, Flux is building the world's first API to make receipt data accessible and standardized. Wonderful. And Aditya. Good morning. Uh, my name is Aditya, and I'm uh, the chief product officer for Bux. Uh, Bux is Europe's largest uh, neo broker. And our goal is to make investing more accessible for, for Europeans. So this session is to explore how open finance will take off. And I think, you know, we'll start by, start with you, Matt. Um, can you give us an overview of the highs and lows of open banking, lessons learned, and what's happening in the industry for open finance? Sure, thanks Lisa. So I think if we look back to where open banking was three or four years ago, the vision was that it would be a standardized set of APIs that people would be able to easily connect to and build great products on the back of it. What's happened is that actually there's huge variation in what people have built. It's not standard. It's not very easy to use if you're just connecting to directly. So actually there's then there's a need for people to kind of up, simplify that and make it easier for, for tech firms, for banks, for corporates, for anyone that's kind of a, looking to use open banking in their capabilities and in their product suite. Um, how do you make that simpler? So people like ourselves at Yapoli, we try to make that simple. So it's about how do we simplify that, have a single API that people can connect to, and then we take care of all that complexity that sits behind it, whether it's UK variation, whether it's the French standard with STET, if it's the German standard with um, the Berlin group, if it's Polish API, if it's CBI Globe in Italy. Each of these countries, by the way the EU have deployed it, have been able to put their own um, wrapper around what open banking looks like and what they're forcing the banks to do. We're now starting to see, I think, if you look across Europe, the UK is the most advanced. Um, OBIE has been key to pushing that by actually forcing standards on banks and actually forcing that customer experience piece. Um, the exemption process of actually having a high performing API has really worked well. So now we have very high resilience in the APIs, great response times, um, and actually we're seeing quite a lot of, of significant exponential growth in adoption. We're now seeing in Germany that they're now going through the exemption process as well. So that will probably be the next market that has this high tier of APIs, but equally in places like Spain and Italy, um, that standardization has come on. So really, I think the key learning is regulators need to be a bit more involved and they need to think about the end consumer and whether that's um, a, a retail user, or whether that's a business, how are those people actually gonna consume these APIs and use them in their day-to-day -day processes? And how does that actually work? Rather than just, do I have an API tick? It's like, how does that actually work for that end user? I think is critical. And when we move to open finance, it's really around making sure that we, we take that learning of letting everyone build their own standard is maybe not the best way to do it. Let's reuse what's been built for open banking and then modify it where it's needed if you need it for a different piece for pension because the data set is different. You need it for insurance. Let's reuse what's been built around security, around authentication, those kind of pieces, rather than reinventing the wheel. Um, I think it's critical here. Thanks, Matt. That was a great overview. And turning to you, Aditya, can you tell us why you used open banking and perhaps give us a, a taste of how it's benefited your customers? Yeah, sure. Actually, before I dive into this, I should, some, some of my past background relates to this as well. I, before I moved to uh, Europe, I'm in Amsterdam now. I work for Ripple, the cryptocurrency company in uh, the US. And then before that, I was at, at Venmo, which is a peer-to-peer -peer payments company based out, based out of New York. So this problem of moving money from one account to another was, was one that we, we tried quite hard to solve. And 
we used to watch with a lot of jealousy the developments in Europe because the U.S. is is even further behind, and uh, all these startups springing up and doing uh, amazing things which we could only dream of because we had no access to any of these uh, this type of connectivity. So it's great to actually be on the other side of the pond and uh, be able to use uh, some of this stuff finally. Uh, at Bux, uh, like I mentioned, we are a um, we're a neo brokerage, so we help people invest, and you can't really do that if people cannot move money in and out of their accounts easily. Um, and that's where uh, open banking comes in for us. And this is not a one-time problem because ideally we want customers to build wealth with us, so they are, um, you know, they're making a deposit every single month and and steadily investing in the market. So it, it's a really critical problem for us to make that deposit process as smooth as as possible. Um, we considered many options for how to enable deposits uh, in our in our app, and we ultimately chose to go the open banking route because we we wanted a method that uh, and a partner, um, and Yapoli is our partner, uh, that we could scale across Europe with easily. So not have to do something custom in every single market that we go to. Uh, and also, uh, it was important for us to feel hyper local. So brokerage is all about trust, and people will not put money into your uh, into your app, into your product, if they don't feel like there's a, a familiarity to it. And there's nothing more local than a local bank. So we see that there's a lot of benefit to being able to associate yourself with uh, bank names that the customer is very uh, you know familiar with, and that that really is something that open banking allows us to do. And then finally, we are we are a zero commission broker. So we needed a payment method that would fit our business model. And if we went out and were paying 2%, 3% on every single trend, every single month when a customer moved 100 bucks into their account, they uh, our model wouldn't work and the customer wouldn't make any money. So uh, it was crucial for us to find a partner who could scale with us in a really hyper-local way and, and also fit our business model. And that's why we turned to open banking. Thanks, Aditya. So open banking essentially has been really central to your to your business model and the way that you deliver value to your to your customers. Yeah, very much so. Um, like I said, if you if a customer can move money into your account, they can trade. And um, it's a recurring problem because we will be building uh, things like, you know, automated investing that on, enable customers to set up every time their paycheck comes in or once a month or every time they make X type of purchase, we want to move money into their brokerage account. And you can't do any of this stuff if you, if you don't have really smooth connectivity into uh, the banking world. Thanks. And Roisin, to, lovely to see you back on screen. So just in time <laughs> to, to pass to you, we're, we're talking very much still about open banking. Can, can you tell us a little bit about how Flux has leveraged open banking? Yeah, sure. So we were actually quite excitingly the, the first AISP in the UK. So we were really kind of at the forefront of this when, when Flux was actually being born as an idea, open banking was just kind of getting started. Um, so we, we see ourselves as part of open banking history. But really interestingly, we actually don't use the open banking APIs. Um, and there's a, there's a few reasons for that. Um, however, we very much see ourselves as a kind of open banking born company and open banking has been a huge help to us and other fintechs. And the reason I say that is because um, what, what is created and it kind of goes to what the other panelists were mentioning is it's created this environment in which open APIs is becoming the norm. And it's pushed banks and, and big financial institutions to think about some of the possibilities that an open API can provide. And that might mean um, easier partnerships, um, servicing more customers with more var variety of products and using partnerships to do so rather than building everything yourself. Um, and that's really where Flux comes in. So although we... Whoop, we briefly lost Rasheen again. Um, I'm sure she'll be back with us shortly. This is unfortunately sometimes features in a virtual event but simon sticking with that theme of open banking can you tell us a little bit about how funding options has seen their customers you know what's the impact been for your customers what's the benefits some of the benefits sure sure um clear, clearly this is proof that this is a live interview um <laughs> so, so open banking has been uh for us i i keep calling it a key enabler um so so our platform 
uh, matches or takes the requirements of businesses who apply for finance online to us. And it ostensibly uh, undertakes a, um, a data-driven sort of triage filtering process to match businesses' requirements with the lender offerings. One of the key uh, facets of, of any lending uh, review is obviously looking at the bank transaction information. So if you're a lender, let's just say you're a business in the UK, you want to borrow £100,000 over X term. Um, a lender to underwrite that deal will need principally three things. Uh, credit bureau information, bank transaction information, and uh, access to management accounts. Those are probably the three most important facets of information. So open banking has been critical to give us a digital way of uh, consuming uh, bank transaction information from customers. So we've embedded that into our uh, customer journey. So open banking is a seamless part of the application process. And we pull in that bank transit transaction information and then we send that across to a matched set of lenders for them to consume and potentially uh, give us even an instant decision uh, or, or you know, ostensibly they will go through their underwriting process. So what open banking has delivered is this key uh, digital way for us to access that information. What we found interestingly is um, that, that we have a very large lender panel and the lenders themselves, um, th there's huge variation in which lenders are ready, who can consume digitally, um, the different ways they want to consume open banking information, and actually in, in some instances whether or not they, they will or, or won't consume it at all. Um, so for us, that's been uh, quite interesting to navigate. So I think the theme of standardization that my, uh, you know, the other panelists have talk, talked about uh, already is, is a critical one. Um, but certainly for us, this has given us uh, an additional capability that allows us to provide a better service for our customers ultimately. Thanks for that, Simon. And, and Roisin, I know that you left us uh, somewhat unexpectedly there, so I wondered whilst we're on the subject of open banking, if you had anything to add from, from the Flux experience. I know you got slightly cut off there midstream. Sorry, yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. I was just saying that it's, it's been a huge benefit to us because open APIs um, as a concept really kind of create this new awareness and this new ecosystem has developed and Flux is very much one of those companies that benefit from that. So we have custom APIs with our bank partners. We don't use open banking spec, um, but the actual the world view that open APIs are the way forward, that they can create partnerships much more quickly, much more seamlessly. You can uh, service more customers with a more variety of products and, and kind of test and run partnerships in a way that banks haven't done before. Uh, I think really it's been what our business is kind of born about from. Um, and so we see a world in which, yeah, open finance even more kind of prominently uh, will be helpful to Flux where we unlock receipt data um, as a concept and we have lots of different use cases that we can start to apply that to. That's great, Rasheen. And, and it's great to see people are already posting some questions in the chat and we, we will get to those in, in a few minutes. But for now, and sticking or going back to you, Simon, rather, and thinking about open finance, right? That next mm -hmm. step on, step up, step on from yeah. open banking. Apart from affordability, what are what other areas do you think that lenders could benefit from and what needs to change to make this happen? Great question. So I think open finance, uh, um, quite simply without using the word open too much, it does open more doors, right? So, so uh, you know, and these are data doors ultimately. So, so for us, um, data, having, having data insights, uh, deeper, greater access to data across the board. So it could be, for example, that you have businesses who utilize, uh, let's just say, take an example of businesses that are experts in e-commerce. Maybe they use Amazon, maybe they use Facebook, maybe they use any, any number of different services and, and having the ability to connect uh, that kind of information digitally and have access to information all in one place. It, it, it simply gives you a, um, a broader aspect, if you like, uh, in, in terms of evaluating uh, you know, the credit worthiness, the lend lending worthiness, whatever you want to call it, um, of businesses. It allows you to, uh, through greater insights, to offer tailor-made services, um, you know, an, an additional value-add opportunities to businesses. Um, for me, when I look at this, there are an inordinate number of 
fintechs, other firms who are all looking at, you know, they're utilizing open banking already. They're looking at open finance as, as a potential future opportunity. I think the interesting question for me, and it's something that I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of considering on an ongoing basis is who's going to pull it all together? Because you've got lots of, as I say, individual companies taking this part of the pile, I'm going to focus on this facet, or I'm going to do this. But who's going to bring it all together holistically? And I think that's that's obviously a debate that's ongoing. Um, and the, the more transparency uh, that we can get from the various different public bodies around what's being considered for open finance, um, the more I think they can get the fintech community involved in those discussions so we can help shape the agenda mm. for me I think that's that's the you know that's the really important uh, uh, uh thing um but overall for me it's it's incredibly exciting and intriguing um but i do think that, that, that you know we need to be brought into the fray and, and involved in discussions uh so that we can help shape it because we're the ones at the coalface and we we talk to customers uh you know every single day Thanks, Simon. And and from someone else at the coalface, Roisin, can you tell us, you know, thinking about open finance, what are some of the things that you can imagine that, you know, could that could bring about and and what could you create, for example, for Flux users? And sure. maybe picking up also on what Simon said, what are some of the stumbling blocks that you see to realizing all of that opportunity from a, a more open sector? Sure. So the reason why open finance is so exciting is if you look at kind of open banking at the moment, it's that high level transaction information. So for, for often that would mean the, the merchant you transacted at, or the, the payment kind of where that went and the amount. Well, Flux goes much deeper is we look at the item level data. So if you transacted at a merchant, we'd have that receipt data information. And suddenly you think about the world of possibilities that opens up. So if you imagine kind of powering a PFM tool or a budgeting app, you're going much more granular in terms of where you're spending. That could be for a small business or a consumer. So suddenly if I'm purchasing something at Amazon, uh, that could be a, a million and one different things. But we can start to drill down on whether that's groceries or electronics and that sort of thing. Um, so there's lots of great things that can then power because it can start to make sense in terms of spend management. It can also start to provide kind of comparisons of where your spend is. Um, but some of the things that we're really excited about are the things like putting control to the consumer. So if you spent some money in a certain place, you might be really thinking about your carbon footprint. Well, with item level data, we could start to provide maybe what that carbon footprint looks like on an item level basis and go far more accurate into those things. The same with nutritional information on your food spend. And so it really is about kind of opening up data and allowing kind of more to be done with that. So there's certain things that consumers value and it may be that Flux can offer those services or it may be there's other fintechs or other apps out there that already offer those services where you're passing that data more easily to them to start gaining that benefit. Um, and I think that's the kind of world that we're really excited to move to is, um, is what other things can be enabled. And there'll be so many things that we haven't yet thought of that our partners and future partners kind of come up with and hopefully they can kind of harness some of the power of this. I like the way you, you put that, Roisin, in that, you know, not just what you can do as an organization, but the other partners you might not even imagine yourself working with, but may well be, be in the future. Um, Aditya, Aditya, I wonder if we could go to you now and, and looking at the future of, of wealth management, for example, what do you see as the biggest opportunities to be gained from, from open finance? Yeah, I think in looking at this, uh, to answer this question, it's, it's helpful to look at how Europe is different from the US. Uh, so if you, if you look at the, the eligible adult population in the US, Roughly 45 to 50 percent of people have a brokerage account uh, because the ethos and really the system in the U.S. is one that encourages people to save for their retirement themselves. And if you look at equivalent numbers in, in Europe, it's around 15 percent. So the opportunity in, in Europe is really greenfield. It's, it's about bringing wealth management to this 85 percent of people who do not invest today. And this really makes the challenge for neo brokers in Europe different from what it is in the US. Uh, and you have to solve different types of problems because most of your users or a much larger percentage of, of your users are first time investors. So unlike in the US where you can you know, simply put, put forth a, a platform that uh, allows easy, seamless uh, buying and selling of stocks, that doesn't cut it here. 
because most of your customers have never done this before. They don't know what it is, and they're they're frankly they're afraid of it too. So as a broker, you have to go one step beyond uh, providing an easy platform and really help people along the journey. And that means everything from the way their account is created to uh, helping them make decisions um, like um, how much, how should I save or how much should I save? What should I put my money into? And being able to personalize this experience for them to actually be effective in uh, in, in getting this 85% of people who don't invest on board. Uh, because everyone's needs are different and someone who's 21 and just out of college, their, their savings patterns or their investment needs are not going to be the same as someone who's a parent and, and 40. Uh, and you, you have to be able to cater to, uh, to all of these uh, types of new investors. And I think that this is where the biggest opportunity lies for uh, open finance and also wealth management in general in, in Europe. Um, payments really, I, I mentioned earlier that deposits is what we use Yapoli and, uh, and open banking for today, but payments are really just the gateway drug when you, when you think of uh, the potential that, 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 that's there in open banking. Uh, and there's much more that we can do if we can connect uh, customers' bank accounts to our platform because we can start to extract insights that will help us make that journey and that get them to jump over that barrier and start investing with us much easier. Thanks for that, Entity. Again, it gives a, a great uh, sense of the, of the possibilities here. And Matt, turning to you and thinking about the companies we have represented on this panel, funding options, Bucks, Flux, what do you think is needed from a data and regulatory perspective to make all of this come to life and, and support all the great opportunities that the panel has outlined for their organizations and others across the ecosystem? <laughs> Thanks for the regulatory question, Lisa. Um, <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> um, so I think, I think if we look at where it is today, lots of markets are already on this journey to open finance. The FCA ran a consultation um, for industry that closed, um, I think it closed in October at the end, because coronavirus delayed it. That's due to publish in January. The UK, a number of part of the UK government's running a smart data um, consultation at the moment. So there's lots of parts of government looking to do this. In Europe, PSD3 is already being talked about by the European Commission and the European Union, and how, how do we move to that next piece? And if you, if you kind of think, originally the UK and Europe were seen as the the trailblazers for open banking and open finance. That's not a risk of being left behind. Australia have gone straight to an open finance model. Brazil are going straight to an open finance model. So if your average user be able to log in and say, I can see my current account, I might be able to see my savings account. Why can't I see my pension? Why can't I see my mortgage? Why can't I see the loan? Why can't I see the investment account I've got with my bank? It makes no sense to them. And we're actually seeing banks get ahead of the curve today and actually produce these extra wealth APIs, so like Barclays put out their wealth API last month. So I think it's it's about actually industry, specifically banks to start with, getting ahead of the curve and trying to offer better products to their customers, whether that's a business or whether that's a, a consumer. But equally, as a regulatory framework, how does it all hang together so that so it's easy for people to get access to these different places? Let's not do a completely different standard for pensions or completely different standard for wealth. Let's try and use these shared learnings and the pain the industry's gone through to get to where we are now. I mean, if you say two years ago when Open Banking went live in the UK, it didn't really work that well. The APIs weren't resilient enough. Now, we see millions of people use it on a monthly basis. Um, and, and like Aditya said, payments, we see payments as the gateway to this. Getting people used to that flow of actually how you consent and how you how you make a, a transaction through this is much much easier to get someone to make a payment using open banking it's very similar to other payment methods you have rather than getting them to share their data but when they see the same flow to come and share their data they've already seen that flow so they're comfortable with it so i think it's let's use those customer experience guidelines let's flow those into other products so that consumer isn't seeing a completely different experience whether they want to share their mortgage or whether they want to share their loans or even if they want to share their pension data. Let's try and standardize that because then people feel comfortable with it. If you look at adoption of any of these new technologies, look at contactless. Contactless now in COVID world is now like the day rigger way of payment. At least it is in London, where I live. Um, 
that took ages to get to that. Contact has been around for 10, 15 years, but we're seeing these adoption cycles shrink um, really quite significantly over time. So will open banking replace all payments? Absolutely not. But in two years' time, I expect to see actually really quite a significant proportion of e-commerce or kind of wealth type top-ups going through open banking because it's it's easier and cheaper than paying by card, but equally mm. people used to that function. So then if you're running a wealth platform like you do, you can then actually say, hey, would you like to share your data? We can tailor some products for you. If you've got if you've got the flux solution and you're actually you're used to that kind of API journey, you may you may not realize it's an API, but if you're used to that journey, you don't mind sharing some more information. And if you're a company and you're actually do it with and you're asking for finance and you're using Simon's platform, you're already used to going through those flows. So you might actually offer up management accounts and you share it via Zero or QuickBooks or something like that. But the flow will look the same. And I think that's the important part. Let's not have completely divergent ways of doing this because then your customer will actually feel more comfortable because they've seen that before. So I think that that customer experience, whether it's a consumer or a business, is critical in, in how we move forward. Most people won't know whether it's a FAPI standard or whatever the security profile is behind mm. them, but they will recognize what the flow looks like. So I think it, putting that at the front and center is critical for regulators as they push this. Yeah, that's interesting because that's part a regulatory story, but the other part is around consumer knowledge, consumer comfort, and, and as they have those experiences, trust continues to build and then the kind of positive that comes out of that is they use it even more. So I wonder, guys, if you mind if we turn to an audience question before we move on. So how feasible and what time scale do you think that open finance is? Open banking data is pretty basic standard in comparison to investments, insurance, mortgages. So what do you think about the feasibility and time scale? And maybe we can start with, with you, Rasheen, on that one. It's a really difficult question in some ways because it depends how you're how you're defining kind of open finance happening. In many ways, open finance is sort of already happening. Um, you know, there are open APIs where you can share and you can uh, glean other products and services by sharing additional data. So an example I always give is insurance. So, for example, you can share more information with your insurance provider right at this moment and often get a better rate for doing so. So a good example might be your kind of, you know, your health and fitness, how often you go to the gym and that kind of thing can get you a better rate on your life insurance. This is the same concept ultimately in, in terms of open finance. Um, so I think it's actually already happening in terms of it kind of becoming a standard and something that everyone is aware of. I think probably we're a while off that, but I think what you'll start to see is some kind of things that to consumers and small businesses, it becomes common sense. You know, if I need a loan, I want to do that quickly. If I want to apply for a mortgage, I don't want to fill in a huge form. So therefore I'll use whatever's at my disposal if that can kind of quicken that process. And I think some of those things will become um, logical and seamless towards the end of next year. Um, but I think we're probably a world away from this kind of full open data in a really nice standardized way that, that one day I think the Flux world envisions where there's um, great knowledge on all these different things you can use your data for. Um, it will be slowly and surely not be as people come across a challenge that they think, oh, good, there's a quick shortcut here or there's a way that I can kind of get access to something. Thanks, Rasheen. And, and what about you, Aditya? Does that kind of time scale feasibility notion, how do you view that? Yeah, as a, as a, I'm more on the consumer end, so uh, the faster is better for us because it, the faster this uh, uh, open banking gets smoother, the, the easier it makes our lives. Uh, but yeah, the, the timeline that you were talking about, it, it makes sense to me. And also we uh, went ahead with open banking partly with an eye on what's happening in the UK uh, and how things have evolved in the UK. And we expect Europe is still, I'd say behind where, where the UK is, but it would follow a similar trajectory, uh, kind of like what Matt was saying that in the beginning, the APIs are harder to work, there's more, variability between how the different banks are approaching it, but then over time uh, you get more standardization and also customers start to trust it more. Uh, and in a, in a way also put pressure on the banks to uh, make the changes that are needed for, for them to use it uh, in a seamless way. So I'd say, yeah, it, it took the UK about two years to go from uh, zero to where, where uh, a point now where you can have millions of transactions uh, going through on it. I, I assume Europe will evolve in a in a similar uh, along a similar path. 
Great, thanks for that. And let's just pick up one more more question from the people watching. So let's start with you on this one, Simon. What are the most important considerations fintechs and banks need to address for open finance to really gain consumer adoption? And and I know Matt, you started to touch on some of that, but let's perhaps you can share your view on that, Simon. Yeah, I think I think Matt did a, a great summary earlier on. So I think trust, um, security. Um, and uh, we need to do, or, or banks and fintechs, it's incumbent on us to really articulate the benefits uh, uh, of open finance, of open banking to, to the end consumers, to businesses. Um, I think we need to do a better job across the board at that. So, uh, you know, why should, if somebody comes to our platform and, and we, we say to them, look, you know, here's, here's open banking, connect your bank transaction information, why what does it give you does it give you access to a premium set of lenders and better value uh, lending at the end of the day does it make it a quicker uh, process which gets you to your end goal uh, within the right time frame potentially yes it does uh, and so you know if we don't articulate it which which uh, which we do um, you know why why don't people articulate that um, so I think I think the sell uh, in terms of adoption is really important um, I think Roshi mentioned the trust factor, or potentially it was Matt or both, but the trust factor is really, really important. So, um, you know, we need to make sure that the implementation of the solutions is seamless, that it is a great customer experience, but also it's uh, it needs to be based on, uh, you know, secure delivery. Um, so, you know, are consumers and businesses uh, information, is that data secure? Is there a risk of it being lost in the ether or being used in, a, in, in, a, in an exploitative way? Um, and again, I think they're just ongoing challenges that we've seen with open banking and they will pass straight through to open finance. So collectively, I think there's a lot to do. Um, dare I say it, post pandemic digitization has accelerated, uh, certainly, certainly in our space. Uh, but I think across the board. So I think the timelines that have been talked about already um, are very, very realistic. Um, but the challenges are still there. Great, thanks for that. And turning to you, Rasheen, I know we started to talk about this a little bit, but what would you like to see happen in 2021 to really start pushing the dial and moving this forwards? Um, I think similar to Simon, I'd like to see the the articulation of the benefits to be really really clear to consumers and businesses and i think that's the thing that will move the needle so i think it's really easy in our world of fintech that we kind of we assume that people would understand that there's a value exchange of sharing data or, or kind of you know everything being via apis that means it's going to be seamless it's going to be great great products that are tailored to you but that's not always that obvious and you know i used to work mm -hmm. at a comparison site you switch and we always knew that it benefited people to switch their energy but it doesn't mean everyone does it because there's lots of different reasons why people don't quite understand that it actually is a quite a quick process and there's not going to be any kind of loss of data or confusion. Um, but these are hurdles that are just natural to overcome. So I think explaining why these things are useful to pick up and, and run with, I think as soon as people start to see benefits and the value is really clear, so they start to have, you know, uh, whether it might be kind of, you know, things are swept in their, their, into a savings account and they start to see that that pool build up or whether that's a really fast mortgage application or a loan that gets approved in, in kind of next to no time, um, the adoption rate will continue. Um, so, so that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see people kind of championing the specifics of the use cases, um, maybe rather than just talking in the kind of holistic terms that we in fintech quite often can, can sometimes fall into because they're really kind of known to us and they're familiar. Um, and I think that that would be the big difference, really. So when it comes to articulating that benefit to consumers, is that incumbent on incumbent or, you know, does that rely on fintechs and, and other players to make that case? Who's going to make that case and educate consumers? Where is where that going to come from? Yeah, I think it's a bit of everyone. It's definitely, you know, ultimately those that are providing the service, it's up to them to explain what that service is and why the data might be necessary to provide an improved service. So if it is that you're going to be able to tailor or personalize a product, 
great. But explaining what does that actually mean? Does that mean money saving element? Does that mean that it's going to be delivered much quicker than before? And I think that, that that's very much on the fintech. But I think as a, as a kind of ecosystem play, so fintechs, banks, insurers, the rest of the financial services world and maybe regulators, um, there's a lot more to be done just to create general awareness that this stuff is safe and secure and it's trustworthy and it's you know, the, the things have gone through the right kind of um, processes. Um, but I think both those things in tandem will mean great results. I, I can see you shaking your head, uh, Titia, but does that make sense to you in terms of how it sounds, you know, how do you bring your end users on that journey to trust and, and comfort and understanding? Ultimately, it sounds like there's a big education piece. Yeah, I, I, I actually think that at least in our world where we're, the customer is being shown a deposit page with a, 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 a open banking method along with other ones. If you can make the open banking method feel as seamless as the other ones, people will use it. Because ultimately, I don't think customers care all that much about the nitty gritty of what's happening in the background. Whether it's a batch file process that is moving their money or it's an API, they, 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 they don't care. What they do care about is how easy it is for them and if it feels safe and secure. I think, um, so one that's incumbent on us to make that process feel as smooth as it can on our side uh, and in the way that we present consent and other things like that to the customer so it's clear and they don't feel like they're being tricked. Uh, and on the other side, I think for me, looking in next year, what would be most helpful in, uh, in allowing us to provide this seamless flow is also as banks start to iron out some of the kinks in their flow. So for example, if you're an app and you are uh, trying to get someone, you're kicking someone over to the bank uh, in order to get consent and start the money movement, but the bank doesn't support it in their app, they only support it through a mobile web browser that looks really broken and it looks more suspect to a customer than if, you could, if they went straight into their bank app. I think it's not a, uh, we can't do it alone. It is, a, it is a joint effort, but I think a lot of it comes down to uh, making it seem transparent, ironing out the kinks to make it feel seamless. And it, if it works just as easily as other payment methods, there's no reason why customers will not adopt it. Great. And sticking with you for a moment, what financial data outside of open banking data and the, the way that's currently limited would create an even better and personalized investment experience for your customers? When, actually, when Matt was talking about um, the, the whole trust piece and people being able to give up their data, it, it reminded me of um, login with Facebook or sign up with Facebook. And that was not that common for a while. Um, and then uh, the social media companies started to allow customers to use their data to sign up for other applications. Mm. And uh, it really took off. And I know it's a bit more complicated in our industry because we're much more regulated, but being able to sign up with your bank for a, a FinTech service where I can then skip my entire onboarding process because I can rely on data that is provided from another financial institution, that would be huge. Because we lose an inordinate number of customers in, in our onboarding flow because of the amount of information you have to collect from them. Uh, and people don't have patience. <laughs> so I think there's a lot that can be done in the whole, uh, let's call it sign up with blank or login mm -hmm. blank uh, space. So I'd love to see that happen. And then when it comes to the actual investment part of the journey, customers get stuck in two places. One is they, especially if you're a new investor, which like I mentioned in Europe is, is most investors. One is how much do I invest? What am I, what is a, what is a good amount for me to save? It's very hard for people to figure that out. And the second thing is what do I put my money into? And I think with uh, access to more information, we can help customers with both of these things. For example, if we have insight into uh, when they're getting paid, what their, what their salary is, what are they paying on rent? Uh, for rent, uh, what are their other spending habits, it is easy for us to then make a recommendation of how much they can set aside if they want to achieve certain financial goals. Similarly, if we know what they're spending their money on, and like Roisin was saying, if you can get itemized receipt data, uh, it makes it easier for us to nudge customers towards certain, certain stocks because we know that even um, novice investors 
they're attracted to and believe in the brands that they use every day. That's mm. a very natural way for you to start investing. And so if we know what it is that they're spending their money on, for example, they buy a Starbucks coffee every day, it's easy for us to then put them into an auto investment portfolio that says, okay, every time you buy a coffee, we'll put one, one euro into a share of, uh, of Starbucks. So I think one is on the login side and the second piece is around getting insight into their, their in, uh, inflows and outflows from their bank account. We can do a lot with that. Yeah, that's great. So it's really making it as easy as possible whilst having that full understanding of customer need that that additional data will enable. Yeah, exactly. And Simon, I wonder if you could tell us what are some of the biggest priorities in the lending space and how can open data help that in the short term or the near term? So the, um, from our perspective, the, the market, it's an interesting word to use these days because I think it's, it's been overused, but I think, I think the SME finance space uh, needs to still be disrupted. Um, and we believe that funding options that we're going to be doing that, um, I, I won't delve into too, too many details, but in the coming months, uh, we think we're going to um, transform uh, and, and commoditize much more, I think, the way SME finance happens. I think data, as I said earlier on, is absolutely key. Um, so when we when we launched open banking or when we uh, embedded open banking into our journey, right from the off, we saw a 20 percent plus uh, take up, which and we weren't doing a particularly good job of selling why it was just embedded into the journey. And it was another step of, you know, connect your bank transaction information here. So we thought that was actually very, very that, that exceeded our expectations. That was very positive. But in terms of the priorities for us, we want to deliver as seamless an experience as possible to our customers. We want to give our customers a holistic view across the market of their funding options in as near to real time as possible. Nobody really does that today, but it will be done tomorrow. Data is absolutely critical. Um, and again, I talked about the, so we work with obviously a large number of lender partners. The, 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 the levels of readiness among, among our partners is, uh, is very, very different. But those that are at the forefront now do have the capability to consume data digitally and spit out a very, very quick decision, positive or negative, digitally. So we can start to showcase real-time offers to customers. Um, and we can do that, not just one selected lender, we can do that multiple lenders. So it's very much moving towards, I guess, a B2C model, but for B2B. Without data, for me, we cannot deliver these kinds of solutions. So again, you know, we are very much pushing the agenda in terms of um, uh, really sort of selling that opportunity to our customers. But then we're also very deep in this lending vertical and we're not going to change that, but we're also going to diversify. So, so having that access to data and the richness of data that we now have through our partners gives us an enormous opportunity to, develop, to diversify our potential revenue streams and diversify into all of the other uh, areas that we've talked about. So business insurance, energy, telcos would be some that sort of spin to mind. But then there's a broader potential payments opportunity there as well for businesses. Again, all of this is powered by data. Without it, um, I don't think we can make, well, I'm certain that we cannot make the strides uh, that we need to to take uh, these propositions forwards. And all of the other fintechs, uh, I think, are thinking exactly the same thing. Thanks for that, Simon. And in the few minutes we have left, Matt, I wanted to turn to you. So the panelists here have given some great examples how access to those greater, you know, larger pools of data can really deliver some, some quick wins for their, for their customers. Can you tell us a little bit about what kind of infrastructure you think is required to support that? And what should companies look for in a provider of that in infrastructure? Sure. Thanks, Lisa. And it's, it's interesting you mentioned infrastructure because we very much see ourselves as an infrastructure play. We don't see ourselves as a consumer branded front end with our logos and our pieces. Uh, one of the pieces that Bucks liked about it is that we're not present in that flow. 
So Yapley does not exist in that journey and we don't want to exist in that journey. So I think when you look at how these pieces are going, I think all the different use cases people have talked about, these extra data areas that can help them power new innovative solutions. For us, it doesn't matter whether it's an insurance policy that we're aggregating, whether it's a transaction data, whether it's a bunch of investment pieces. It's all the same for us in how we consume that and how we standardize that, normalize it and make it available for our customers to then build great products on the back end. And I think if you look, I'll kind of come back to that trust piece that people have talked about. People want to have that same journey experience. They want to feel they want to feel it's a trusted journey. They don't want to go through a screen scrape view, a reverse engineered view, any of that. They don't really want to go through a web page on a mobile app. They want, they want to actually see an app-to-app -app journey because it just makes it more comfortable for them. They can biometrically authenticate. They don't have to go and remember what their username is and their mother's maiden name. And I, I can't remember the last time I logged into my, my online banking, but I use the app every day. So I'd literally would have to go and get the paperwork out where I've securely written it down so I could log into that. So I think it's about, I think it's about how, do we make, how do we make that as secure as possible? And then when people are looking for a provider that can help them with that, most ven most companies I talk to are looking to minimize the number of vendors and partners they work with. So they don't want to work with someone in each different market. So here at Yappy, that's why we see ourselves as an infrastructure play. We're looking to provide as much coverage to the highest quality that we possibly can. All we do is connections to open APIs. We don't do anything else. So for our customers, we focus on that. We allow them to then build the great propositions that have the what's in it for me, for the, for the end user, whether that's a, a consumer looking to find out their carbon footprint, whether the consumer looking to invest more in their product, in things they like, or whether it's a company trying to get better financial um, products. For us, that's what our customers build. So for us, it's about can we build the broadest coverage in as many countries and actually bring those banks to the standards. So we work closely with banks in Germany, with the guys at Bucks. We've pushed through the Spark Ads and so that kind of local piece of 400 banks under one API piece. We've worked with them to push that localization. I think that's really important that people do feel that they they, they recognize that journey that they're on. Um, so, so I would just say, look for someone who can provide you the broadest coverage. That means you don't have to have multiple integrations and multiple points of failure. Thanks for that, Matt, and that's a great note to wrap up on. Unfortunately, we're out of time, so thanks to all of you on the panel for your contribution. You've given us a fantastic overview of, of what the possibilities are, how we might get there, and, and some of the infrastructure that, that we might use to do that. Thank you to everyone watching for your questions. Um, can I ask everyone now to jump over to our next interactive session, Financing in 2020, which will be starting in, in just a minute. So click on that sessions icon on, on the left-hand side of your screen and, and jump in there. Um, and yes, just thanks again to all of you. Matt, I know that you and the team are available on the platform if anyone wants to discuss this, this stuff further. There were quite a few comments and questions we were unable to get to, um, but you can find them by looking in the People's tab. So send them a message. Great, guys. Thanks again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.